That's okay. Right. It says it's recording, so that's good news. Yep. Yeah, getting going. Are you okay then, Jen? Should we make a yeah, okay. Okay. Yes. Welcome everybody. Um my name is Ian Roderick, and today's session is about Planet Local Summit that uh, Jenneth uh, attended in September of this year. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, it's one of these big events, two days, a um, lot of people there, a lot of discussion, and we, Jenneth thought it fairly valuable, and I agree with it entirely, to sort of review that and um, see what observations came out of it. Um, it was held in Bristol. Um, and it did attract a, a, a very large number of people. Uh, and, and so that's what we'll be discussing. So please feel free to uh, ask questions. The protocol is pretty much as normal. Um, uh, if you have any question you want to put in the chat, that helps. Um, yeah, generally, I was going to talk for a bit and then we'll yeah. have questions if that's all right. Yeah, and uh, we'll, we'll use I might that. lose my train of thought otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> which it happens you quite know. easily. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so we'll we'll sort of manage that. I think we're just about enough to sort of manage one one session, so no no breakouts today. So um, let's make a start by having a very quick um, introduction to everybody. So you've got one minute only, so make it very very quick, please as we seem to be getting uh, a good number of people coming in. Um, I, I hope you all know who I, uh, I am, and, and, and Dennis will introduce himself <laughs> in a minute as well. So let's start um, with my screen here. Hugh, if you could just say quickly who you are. Thanks. Yeah, you, you're muted. You have to unmute first, yep. Hi, I'm Hugh. I'm a fellow at Schumacher. I used to lecture in political science, but I'm retired now. And what I'm interested in now is uh, new economics. I did a project with John, who's in the screen, and, uh, and Jenith and a number of others on new economics, new systems, and it produced a book. Uh, and I've just written a blog, which I haven't done anything with yet, on football and the new economy. So <clears throat> that's my interest. Thank you. <laughs> Ian, you're muted. Sorry, I'm muted. Thank you. Gene, <laughs> uh, you're, you're next on my screen. That'd be good. Thanks. Yeah, I, I spent uh, 45 years as a systems thinker and got tired of pushing a rock uphill, so I became a storyteller. <laughs> I live on a sandbar on the east coast of the United States, about a mile from the Wright Brothers Memorial. So I tell stories about relationships and their implications. And people then say, well, doesn't that sort of relate to everything? And I say, yeah, that's the curse. <laughs> Thanks, Gene. Uh, uh, Richard. Hello, uh, I'm uh, one of the Schumacher crowd. Uh, my focus uh, is in the energy sector, although uh, now more and more focused on communities as a as a, as a sort of quantum of, of, of society and working on various projects within my local community. Thanks, Richard. Uh, James. I'm from the uh, Milton Keynes Green Party. Um, I've recently been in Totnes for the film festival. Um, so that's what I've been doing. Thanks, James. Uh, Robin. Um, hello, I'm Robin Atfield. I'm um, a retired professor of philosophy at Cardiff University, and I'm also a participant in Schumacher. And um, I, my latest book is um, The Ethics of the Climate Crisis, and it's coming out from Polity Press next April. Oh, brilliant. Thanks. Um, uh, Amanda. Hello. I'm at the other end of the spectrum from the previous speaker. I'm doing a PhD, um, and I'm looking at um, how joined up is Extinction Rebellion. Um, from the local to the global. Right. Oh, fascinating. Uh, however, the previous speaker was was brought up quite close to the University of Hertfordshire. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> and just to add to it, I went there as well. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, Preksha, nice to see you again. And my face has recovered. Just to let everybody know, I had a 
dental appointment this morning. The side of my face completely numb, but I'm just about being able to speak again nicely. But Preksha and I had a session this morning. So Preksha, would you like to say who you are? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Preksha. Um, I'm doing a work placement with Schumacher from Bristol University. Thank you. Lovely. Uh, John. This, oh, hi. Hello, I'm John. Uh, I'm um, one of the Schumacher crowd, um, to, quote, to quote Richard. Uh, and also to quote somebody else, Hugh, I was involved in the book New Systems, New Economy. I'm sort of interested in this area Jen's going to talk about, largely in terms of how it can help decolonize our own minds, because I feel that that we, you know, we've been, our minds have been colonized by all sorts of things, uh, not least the, the vestiges of empire in this country. So the more we can get rid of that, the better in my view. Thanks, John, would agree entirely. Um, Bob. Hi, everyone. Uh, I wasn't at the Planet Local so Summit, but I have two people staying with me, one of whom was, um, Kerry Turner and Mark Pearson. And they were hoping to join this too, um, but they're struggling with airline tickets at the moment for a flight tomorrow. Right. I'm a community activist in Kingston, uh, and my interests are Extinction Rebellion and a climate emergency centre there called the Kingston Hive. So it's doing community activity. Great. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Henry? You're, uh, you're muted, Henry. Yeah. <laughs> I knew I would be. <laughs> hi, hi everyone. My name's Henry. I'm um, a regenerative agriculture advisor for farmers directly, specialising in holistic management, uh, based up in Lancashire in the UK. And it's my first one of these sessions. I met Jenneth at the uh, Planet... Uh, Plan What's it? What is it? It's the Planet Local Planet Summit. Planet Local, Western. yeah. That's, the one. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I always think of local futures because I think that's the organisation, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm being invited to speak at one of these in a month's time. Is it, Ian? Sometime at the start of January. It is. I was just going to give a plug for you for your talk. Um, <laughs> what's this space for for Henry talking in January? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So thank you for the invitation and looking forward to Jennifer's pre presentation. Great. Thanks, uh, Mike. Is that me, Ian? Yeah, that's you, Mike. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I can't see everyone. Um, yeah, uh, my name's Mike. I'm involved in uh, Schumacher Institute, and my day job is working for Transition Network, overseeing Transition Together Project, which is supporting the movement in the, in the UK. And I'm also involved in Control Shift, um, the which is a partnership trying to bring together organisations to change what's going on. Um, yeah, and I, I was at the summit as well. Um, I, actually, I attended it, yeah. Good, lovely. Uh, Anna. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm, excuse me, I'm a landscape architect in London. Um, I do a lot of uh, local community greening projects and I'm sort of a newcomer to um, Schumacher. I just started reading Small is Beautiful and I, I wanted to learn more. Great, thanks Anna. Uh, Chris. Hi, Chris. We we can't we can't hear you at the moment. No. Um, should we try again in a minute? Yeah. No, he's he's um can't hear us. Let's move on to Julia and see if we can come back to Chris in a minute. Julia, hi. Oops. Has my sound on? Can anybody hear it? Cannot hear anything. Oh, I can't sorry. hear anything either. We can't hear them. We can't hear you either. Oh, what a what a coincidence that was. We'll come back. Let's go on. Uh, Veronica, Moy, how are you? 
Uh, yes, hello. I've been with Schumacher a very, very long time, but nobody will know me, I'm sure. Um, I don't get out much now, so most of my work is done from home. I write uh, eco greeny type poetry. Um, I'm also an archery researcher and historian, and I write about that as well. I do as much networking and supporting of others as I, as, as I feel able, and that's the, the, the only way I can work. Thanks, Veronica. Uh, Nick Nicolette, how are you? Um, yes, I'm Nicolette Voter, um, a regenerative placemaking consultant, um, also a pluralist economist, um, and I'm fascinated with the um, trying to give economics a spatial dimension. I was at the local, the Planet Local conference, well, at least a couple of days of it. And um, yes, yeah, really excited about um, the, the local, the, the local inspiring global and hold solutions or solutions to global problems. Right. Thanks, Nicolette. Um, Vasiliki. Hello. Hi. I am Vasiliki. I'm actually a fellow of the Schumacher Institute. Uh, I'm also a lecturer in sustainable curriculum. My interest is in education for sustainable development. I did not attend the summit, but I really look forward to, to hearing from Janet, who I haven't seen in a long time. And I'm happy to see you as well here, <laughs> whom I know from the uh, London Regional Center of Expertise on ESD. So great to see you all. Great. Thanks, Mr. Uh, uh, Katie. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, Katie Dick, a fellow of the Institute and um, mostly recently involved in producing a toolkit for community groups who want to take action on climate change, seeking to embed sort of systems thinking principles into that. Um, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, Peter? Are you there, Peter? Ah. Hi. <clears throat> yeah, hello. Um, yeah, I'm Peter. I'm involved in uh, education for sustainable development for an organization called Guy Education. We're working, well, worldwide, some sort of, at least 55 countries and develop curricula in that space, um, I'm specifically responsible for the sustainable development program. And yeah, I, I haven't been at, uh, um, at the summit or whatever it's called, but I've watched some of the recordings and still looking forward to see uh, what other people in the room think of it and where the discussion leads us. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Um, right, I've got uh, Beth. Are you there, Beth? No, maybe not come in yet. Um, Chris, are you? Um, yeah, you hear me now? Yep, we yeah. Now? yeah. Okay, good. I'm Chris Sunderland. I've been involved in things like the Bristol Pound and part of Schumacher and particularly interested in this topic because I've been trying to do something locally as as a sign of what can be done globally. Um, my my latest contribution has been to put up a series of videos on YouTube called Beneath the Surface of the Environmental Crisis. Thank, thanks, Chris. Lovely. Uh, Julia, are you, are you there? No. Anybody? Um, Julia, Julia left a message, she put a message probably in the chat. Oh, right. OK. Right. right. Okay, right. So there's in the chat there, folks. And uh, uh, as it's, um, I've been inundated. I think everybody else has by requests for donations from all kinds of charities today. It's Giving Tuesday, it seems. Uh, so there's our contribution in the chat to um, supporting our work in in India with uh, social change and development. So um, yeah, I keep plugging it wherever I can. So there you go. That's uh, that's our contribution to today. Um, and thank you everybody for your uh, for your introductions. I think we've got a, a great. Um, variety of people here today. Um, over to Janice to introduce herself and to tell us all about Planet Local Summit. Thanks, Janice. Hey. 
Hello, so I'm Jenneth and um, I have a background in philosophy. In fact, Robin was my tutor at one time. And um, then I went on to, well, I've always worked with social movements. So I have that kind of perspective and I'm quite, very well, I've always been interested in politics, but in the broader sense. So quite a bit of what I say today will come from a bit of a political uh, analysis kind of perspective. Um, I worked for uh, quite a long time in education for sustainability uh, and um, directed a programme that was put together by WWF and uh, Oxfam, co-directed with my colleague, Ros Wade. Uh, and then I moved into more into research where I was um, able to work on quite a lot of really interesting international projects using systems thinking and get my head round how systems thinking and sustainability issues relate to each other. Uh, and, and that's as far as I've got now anyway, of course, it's an enormously huge and perpetual learning journey, but um, my discussing and um, sort of uh, putting things together with colleagues from the Institute and hearing people's feedback and everything has been always very inspiring. So um, I should say that, of course, um, you won't be hearing all about the summit because it was just an enormous event uh, and there's a lot to, you know, a huge number of different facets to it. So I'll be, you know, you'll get a sort of mixture, I think, of um, probably you'll be able to detect a few bees I've got buzzing around in my, in my bonnet. Um, so there'll probably be a little bit of um, my preoccupations in there, but I'm also going to try to talk a bit more about this issue of scale um, and and how that relates to a sort of, um, you could call it an ideology of localism and what does that, how does that play out and how, I suppose I'm always concerned about the kinds of alliances across boundaries that we're going to need to make to really bring the extent of change that we need to see. Um, and especially in the face of all the enormous uh, challenges and uncertainties that we've got currently. Okay, so um, I'm going to, uh, I have a little presentation which is partly for purposes of guiding me, um, but also um, a few diagrams and things which I'll speak to later on in the in the um, talk. But I'm going to also look at the website of the event, which has lots of information on it, and just sort of talk you through a little bit of that uh, as, a, as an aid memoir to myself, but also to encourage you to go and look at it um, and you know see what sessions are there and explore it as a resource um because you know that's one of the ways i do look at things um that they you know events like this events like this are an enormous amount of investment of time and energy on the part of many many people and uh, if you bring a lot of people together, and perhaps especially if you're going to fly them around uh, from across the globe so that they come together, you need to be pretty sure that it's going to be a worthwhile event. Uh, and I I do think on so many levels, this was hugely worthwhile. And a lot of the points I have to make, which may sound more critical or an and analytic, apply not only to this event or this organization but to us all you know and and all the agendas and issues that we're we're sharing and in particular with regard to that i'm sort of referencing an event that we had uh, earlier this year because it's 50 years since the publication of small is beautiful and uh, we had a a lovely event which was quite celebratory but it, you know it did raise some some quite uh, difficult questions as well um small is beautiful being a sort of iconic book by ef schumacher and um, which is why we're called the schumacher institute and whose work inspired uh, quite a family of organizations and so 
this whole question of smallness and what it means and what it implies. And as my Lancashire dad would put it, how damn big is little? <laughs> what do we mean by smallness? Um, and why is it important is, is sort of one of the questions I'm going to bounce off from uh, with regard to looking at the whole planet local event and agenda. So um, I'll have a go at sharing my screen. There we go. Okay. Quite doing what it should do. Right, is that uh, is that slide one you can see there? Yeah. All okay. Great. Fine. Okay. Um. So I was in the blurb to advertise this um event. I put in a few questions, which I think will emerge as we go through but also I just wanted to sort of flag them up um, to start with can you have a global movement for localism and this because this was one of the sort of agendas of the event um, and what might that look like uh, what are the tensions between levels um, and synergies indeed or potential synergies uh, between levels, local, regional, national, and international. Um, and there's a strong thread around indigenous uh, livelihoods and knowledge and so indigenous societies in uh, the event, which was, you know, really rich and welcome. But I just want to dig a little bit into some of perhaps a sort of some of the ideology perhaps around that and what what's actually happening here um how how are these how is the um how are the still existing elements of traditional knowledge and ways of living and societies um being used if you like or uh, as resources and or inspiration by people from a different situation and how does how do those interact? Because um, I don't think it's very, it, it's straightforward. And how does this link to issues of decolonization, et cetera, and many more issues like that? So there's piles and piles of stuff here. And as I mentioned, it's particularly interesting uh, with the whole smallness discussion is there something primary or fundamental about the local? In what sense? And what about nested scales and interactions across those scales? Are we seeking sort of balance? What, what might that look like? And how would we know it if we got it sort of thing? Um, so some very broad questions, but also I hope to bring it a little bit down to some uh, more grounded issues as well. I will, I will talk a bit. Whoops, sorry. I will talk a bit about um, the presentation I did and how I tried to address some of these issues in that. Um, right. I'm just going to stop sharing for a minute. So that's that's sort of um, what I'm going to try and do. And I'm going to now share with you the it works the website of Planet Local Summit. Great. I think that's worked, has it? Yeah. So um 
Oh no, that's that's uh, actually this is the this is the the organisation uh, who led on this is called Local Futures, the sort of byline of economics of happiness. Uh, and this event, as I have mentioned, was very international. Um, obviously, there was a lot of people there from Bristol. And I think it's interesting, uh, again, you know, how local is local. I mean, Bristol is a huge city. And of course, one of the interesting advantages of urban living is that is that um, people come together in such numbers that there's there's enough of of any one group that who can sort of coalesce around things and in Bristol uh, there's a very healthy sort of um, culture and uh, groupings of people who are really interested in sustainable futures uh, but is that you know that's also quite a feature of Bristol as a city uh, but it's a particular kind of city uh, of course such groupings happen elsewhere more locally as well. So it Bristol formed a very good sort of um, ground for this event to happen. It was, you know, lo nice, interesting local venues. And it was, you know, it was really um, a joyful event in many ways and very interesting to, to meet a lot of people. Um, and very, I would say, it was it had more, much more breadth of content uh, than I was initially expecting. So I'm just going to walk you through the program a little bit. Um, so Helena Norberg Hodge is kind of um, what you might say one of the global stars of localization, of whom there were quite a few there. Uh, and she has been working on this kind of area for a long time. You may have seen learning from Ladakh on and this whole concept of ancient futures. Um, and it her sort of life's work really is very much about, at least partly about really valuing and validating and discovering the value and talking about the value and building on the value of not just um well, not to mean just localism, uh, but specific uh, forms of um, indigenous wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, um, especially around how we live with uh, the environment, but also how we live with each other and other forms of social solidarity that are felt to exist in some indigenous uh, cultures, perhaps more than in our rather fragmented, mod modern, urban um, lifestyle. So there was a lot of, a lot of um, very, you know, interesting conversations, which um, were in a sort of plenary form. Um, living cultures old and new, um, obviously, you know, all of these, all of these um, presentations raise piles of issues. Uh, Daniel Christian Vahl is somebody who's fairly um, close to the Institute insofar as I would say, uh, because we're a systems thinking Institute, we do tend to think that there are some benefits about modernity in the sense that I suppose we don't we do think that there are elements of really useful and interesting knowledge that exist in um, modern societies vis-a-vis uh, <laughs> -vis systems knowledge. And I suppose we might think, and this is an interesting question which we can return to later, we might think that, uh, I think some, some of us do, um, systems thinking is a kind of the next phase of modernity, like we've gone beyond the sort of clunky um, or trying to get beyond uh, the clunky earlier beginnings of modernity and kind of um, linear universal laws and um, 
yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it there for now. But Daniel, I think, is also trying to work with this idea of old and new living cultures and how they work, how we how they work together um, and how the different kinds of knowledge that we have in the world can be uh, can be used and accessed by everyone to help us through this really difficult but crucial time that we're all in. So uh, then we had some breakout sessions and uh, these were really where the, the participants got more to engage, although um, there were still quite a lot of presentation and I guess, um, I guess one of the things I might uh, say about about it, um, perhaps from the point of view of, uh, was the event designed to help uh, develop, uh, use the f networking and so on to help develop a sense of strategy between people or uh, a sense of uh, helping the movement together think through some str strategic questions. I'm not sure because I don't think there was really enough time for people to do that. And I wouldn't say that was specifically organized. So all the sessions were really about uh, different angles uh, of of stuff they were load, loads of really interesting things um the session i did was the new economic thinking session with diana finch for also from bristol uh, we worked on bristol pound and jay tompt uh and i'll come i'll come back to that um yeah so i'm just just give you a sense of the kind of different stuff that there was um, a, a very broad church, I would say, of different elements. Uh, but I will also go on to say, well, what's interesting about what wasn't there or, you know, the, the discourses, the boundaries, the sort of soft boundaries, perhaps, that might have might I perceived to be around it. So we had something about insane global trade, for example, um, and other more, you know, post-collapse society, um, some sort of um, ways of rethinking. Uh, I think that was there was some very good stuff there, actually, about about the challenges, as John Blewett was saying earlier, the challenges of actually getting our minds um, free enough to rethink the regenerative future. And here's where I do think absolutely that uh, looking at and engaging with um, what somebody said, indigenous, some indigenous societies are like a portal to remember different things that we may have forgotten um, and to help us, you know, um help perhaps the emergence of of something new and i'm also reminded uh though as well of um a tendency and i think this is a definitely a sort of colonial um perhaps hangover that people have imagined that indigenous societies there was a don't progress or don't innovate um there was a sort of colonial kind of um divide between so-called traditional societies who uh, stayed the same allegedly you know generation after generation after generation and those that innovated um and of course you know fast capitalism is held to be um a sort of hyper almost insane form of uh, perpetual innovation um guided by what we will perhaps discuss later but um yeah so the there's a sort of perhaps a tension between the idea that indigenous societies may encapsulate and and sort of protect in some way 
values and <clears throat> sensibilities and ways of being that perhaps we've lost, and um, which I'm not sh entirely sure if that uh, that allows for for the fact that societies um, of all kinds will are and are undergoing change and what are the tensions there with that. And I'll I'll tell you a bit later about. Oh, it's I won't. I'm not uh, going to cover all the racier um, arguments that happened at the event, uh, but uh, I will tell you, I'll tell you one of the interchanges I had, which I think was quite, I found quite kind of revealing or, and or, um, you know, food for thought, let's say. So some more breakout sessions as well. So there was plenty of um opportunity to go to different things, but because there were uh, these quite a lot of presenters, um, people didn't get that much time to to talk to each other. Uh, and there was, there was no small group work kind of thing going on. It was fairly, I mean, some actually some, I, I tell a lie because some people running these sessions did use uh, various approaches which were much more interactive. So I went to something about local uh, to global run by our friends in Echo Lees. Echo Lees being a, um, a sort of associate, an European association of local sustainability initiatives. Uh, and uh, there were people there from Echo Lees from, and they put together a, a workshop which was, which was pretty interactive. Yes, so um, then there were, you know, went right on into the evening and the attendance was very good. I would, I'm not terribly good at estimating numbers and I'm not entirely sure how many people went, but I would say it was like 600, 700 people over the course of two days. Um, so, you know, pretty impressive turnout. I guess maybe half of those people were from the Bristol area, maybe slightly more. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, certainly if you look at all the speakers, they probably add up to quite a vast being, you know, all together about 80 speakers. So some really interesting um, perspectives on the Saturday, um, which, you know, I think you can hear quite a lot of these panels um, in the sessions you can are in the recorded sessions if you I've put the link to this in the chat so you can go and and have a look at these I think the plenary sessions were recorded but the rest of them weren't <clears throat> yes so else is there to say yes yeah, so well here's some more breakout sessions um some of them were repeated um yeah these this catalyzing community-led movements for systemic change that was the echo lees uh, and um repes meta networks and that that was interesting because the repes meta network so-called specifically was about um that uh the syn how we make the synergies between international movements uh, national movements and the local uh, so they did begin to to address that challenge which is of course an enormous topic but at, at least that was there um yeah so you can you can get an idea here of some of the other stuff that was on um there was a good mix of um stuff about how the personal and subjective and um one's own responses and um capacities and so on for to contribute to change and to even flourish in this in this extremely difficult space we're in was was part of this but also recognizing these difficulties together I guess you know it's always good to 
to hear from other people who are feeling similarly to yourself. And I, um, there is a sense you could say, okay, well, this was a very a nice little bubble, you know, happening in Bristol, even though it was quite a big bubble. And um, how damn big is little? Um, <clears throat> it was, you know, I, I've, um, I've come to think it's very important. <clears throat> pardon me to. Uh, people say you're preaching to the converted and all that but I think it's very important to keep the flame alive you know because um, as one of our colleagues in SCAD uh, said you can't light someone else's candle unless you keep your own flame alight and if you go to an event uh, where which helps provide you with inspiration and and some more and some new insights and you know a bit of grit as well um then that's great and i i feel that definitely fulfilled that function and perhaps you know that's uh um sometimes that's all you can ask but i think i suppose i thought that the ambition of this uh in terms of size and participants uh and the breadth of of topics perhaps might have lended itself to something a little bit more strategic However, right, I'm going to go back to the session on um, new economy, which indeed, here we are, new economic thinking. So uh, as part of my pretty short contribution to this event, this was very well attended. People are very interested and engaged with thinking trying to think through new economy um i suppose i was immediately started out by saying well um you know economy is always and uh ever political and politics is always about economy as well in the broadest sense and that's where i'm starting from um and also that uh, <clears throat> if you look at the economic, if you look at the drivers today of the kind of economy that you that we have, then we are often looking at drivers that are on um, a level that is not local. So we're looking at the a lot of what we're addressing, have to address, I would argue, is our drivers and structures in society that are not at the local level. Um, and I'll come back in a minute to explore that a little bit through diagram because in the Systems Thinking Institute, we like diagrams. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I tried to ground it a bit by talking about Wales, um, which is where I now live, and um, talked about the way in which most contemporary economics is about the actually existing economy and how it works um, or doesn't work. Um, but what we're often trying to do in new economy is to think about how it could work. And there's a sort of, you know, where's the, the bit in the middle about getting from A to B, um, transitioning the economy and, and how do we do that? And that's when I was talking a little bit about Wales and saying that, we're talking about economic transition. One of the things that I've learned about transition uh, is that um, we're now, it's very much now um, being discussed. The just transition is an essential element of it because unless you're going to make, um, unless you're going to make changes at least fair for people who are going to be affected, how, however you define that. If you can improve on justice and um, if, if improve on equality, then you're going in the right direction. Um, at the same time as changing, changing the economy. It has to be politically viable, in other words. Um, it's not, you know, so let's think about that. Uh, and I raised the the question about the difference between or, or the and the similarities between political economy, which has always looked really at uh, 
um, I would say, a, a fairly dissociated concept of economy, which has looked, which hasn't thought about the basis of economy in in living systems, and political ecology, which tries to do more of that, um, but to say as well that uh, I don't think that we have yet found or um, there's still a great many research programs, let's say, ongoing in new economic thinking. So it's not like we've got uh, we've got there and we've just got to apply it. it. And again, you know, raising the point, the systems point about emergence, that maybe what we're we're trying to do is is work with sort of the drivers that we can see and um, the ever changing uh situation that we're in to try and sort of uh nudge and and uh cu curate things and push things support things in the way that we think would be better uh at the same time as being very adaptive and learning along the way so from i guess from a sort of system thinking point of view any blueprint for economy would would probably be some kind of disaster so to that extent, we may agree with the neoliberal writers uh, about the potential disaster of trying to impose fully worked out solutions onto something that is vibrant, shifting and also full of agents, as is uh, society and economic activity. However, um, economic life does currently operate under a certain agreed social rules and there's no reason why we shouldn't try to change the broad social rules under which economic freedom can could be practiced um uh, and and tilt those rules more in favor of equality and protection of the environment um and i was raising the question of the role of the state in helping to enable this the development of local economy with those characteristics um, and talking about the way the Welsh government is trying to approach it uh, because there's a certain a certain amount of um, perhaps opposition um, being uh, expressed um, in the summit by some of the plenary, you know, some of the quite prominent plenary speakers between, you know, um, big state, um, that, you know, the big state was was always going to be a problem and, and lo the local was where everything good was at. Um, and also perhaps a, a rather simplistic uh, equivalence between right and left without really defining what anyone meant by that um yeah well, i'll come back to that in a minute because there was uh, when i get to the ideology um, perhaps i better not go on too much longer um when i get to the ideology there was a pamphlet produced um for the summit which was a very interesting document and you know all more power to them for actually trying to summarize what they were about um and giving giving people something to work from um but i think you know again you know it reminds me that movements are not really democratic they don't necessarily try to be democratic because i think if you were going to try to say this is a summit for really critically exploring and developing the strategy of this movement you would have put this out sort of first and got everybody to discuss it quite a lot and and change it perhaps you know um but uh, it was it's a very it's an in very interesting document which which has some some really great bits in it and some bits that i would find a little more questionable anyway uh so yeah i was talked about the way that the welsh government is trying to transition the economy by working with the foundation economy concept which um I dare say people know about and that in itself would be another probably another talk so I won't go too much on about that but um okay so I think given the time I'm just going to quickly go to 
my diagrams and um, have a bit of ramble on about those for a little while and, and then we can um, talk between ourselves and and um i'd love to hear your thoughts so uh, okay okay so um this is an adaptation of um a great diagram which um well it's an adaptation of an adaptation actually isn't it ian <laughs> Uh, because Ian uh, Ian uh, adapted this from a, a diagram um, put together by Giels uh, in the context of looking at transition, and there's a certain notation they use for the wider landscape, the regime, at, or which by which they mean the sort of social arrangements and the and the grassroots. Um, and but also we're thinking about i guess we could have a delay on both sides couldn't we really that that um changes at the global level sort of feed down to the local level but it, it takes quite a lot of time and of course the local is very uneven as well it, it's not every uh, local area isn't impacted equally by um the mega trends they go sort of if you like they go through the different contexts and so on if we were going to really talk about all the contexts we'd also include the sort of different um ecological contexts because of course some some areas are more on the uh are more robust to perhaps climate change for example um they've got more there's more sort of wriggle room, if you like, in, in their, um, for example, food production and the kind of biome that they are. Other areas are very fragile to any kind of disturbance and that will affect the state of the local um, society. Um, but then, of course, the local and the state of the local sort of necessarily feeds back into our, our um, landscape um, and in you know in a very profound sense the global is composed of the local you can't have a healthy global ecology if you've got wrecked local ecologies um, and you know we might we might say the same about human societies in fact that's pretty much where our our um idea of convergence comes from that we can't really have a healthy global society unless we we help everywhere every location develop uh, as much as is possible within you know some some kind of attention to planetary boundaries so this was just this is just a, a way to sort of ask some questions i guess about well what do we mean when we're talking about localization sorry um and what are the are we actually saying which i think we probably are um and if we are let's say it properly and let's think about it properly are we saying that we want arrangements at other levels to enable the healthy the health of the local i think that's probably what we're trying to say and in, in that case don't we need to directly tackle and name some of the enormous problems uh, that we're getting from, from um, the landscape? Which, which I have to say was a bit muted in, in, in this event in, in, in some ways. There again, uh, there's the question of... Um, the, the question of modernity. Now, I'll just tell you this sort of an anecdote that happened at this event. Um, actually, somebody was talking about, um, I think it was Ladakh actually, that that they had sort of control on the amount of tourists who were coming in. And um, one of the people was saying, oh, well, they've now had to agree to let in a lot more because there was local pressure for jobs and so on. And somebody's going, oh no, that's terrible. 
that will wreck them, that will destroy their society. And I was saying, well, but you, but it's understandable, isn't it? Because people need work and um, they want, you know, a certain amount of development. And uh, <laughs> that really didn't go down very well at all. Um, and and that basically, there's a sort of sense that. Um, you know that somehow the these areas need to be kept in cotton wool away from the uh, rest of the changes of the world, which of course is pretty impossible. But um, and it also reminded me of somebody saying, "Well, yes, um, quite a lot of the indigenous leaders from the Amazon are now um, learning um, learning languages, and they're going and getting degrees because that's part of the way that they see that they will." They will um, be able to help protect and develop their culture in the situ in this current situation, and I guess I was just thinking that what we're really often really talking about is instead of just sort of contrasting things and saying oh one's bad and one's good, I think we're talking about them both changing in different ways, and thinking about repurposing elements of modernity and tradition. Because our conversation about Ladakh ended up with me saying something along the lines of, well, the trouble is, of course, we've never had a non-capitalist modernity. <laughs> and we sort of played around with that idea for a little while. Um, what what might that mean? Was that a meaningful concept? Yeah, so kind of how we see change happening and how we think we can help steer it is a question which we think about quite a lot in the Institute. And then finally, just thinking about values and the kind of values that we might be looking at. Um, how can we decide what we want to keep and what we what we try to get rid of? Um, what what kind of value are we capturing in the local? And part of the reason I put this in is because we're working currently on a sort of community community systemic appreciation um sort of process which we think could might help um local communities capture things that, that they value in in their locality relationships and so on in this particular case in relation to nature and local wild spaces um but could be applied to all sorts of things really it's a kind of uh, perhaps a slightly more systemic form of appreciative inquiry. What do we value? What do we keep? What do we want more of? And what is threatening those things? And can we use that understanding to perhaps surface our values more strongly um, across different dimensions and help protect the things that we care about? And I think that's really a lot of what the summit is about. And I have tremendous, huge areas of agreement with um, with a lot of the people there. And, and as I say, it was very diverse anyway. Um, I think that was a great, a great, pretty big spectrum of views represented. OK, I, I'll stop there. So if that's been a bit of a ramble, um, as you can see, it's it's um, prompted a lot of a lot of thinking. And I think it'll be useful for us when we trying to plan an agenda for our online retrospective that we're going to have in the new year um, on, on the whole point about smallness and why, why are we talking about it and what, what do we mean when we say small is beautiful? Do we mean something different now? Okay, thank you very much for listening, everyone. Right. Thank you, Janice. That was uh, extraordinarily interesting insight into a, a very large event and lots of lots of people's thoughts. Um, obviously, impossible to condense them all into a I'm short time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's prompted uh, some thoughts for me, undoubtedly, um, around things like uh, the place of local thinking in large scale transitions. Um, we, we're undergoing large scale transitions at the moment, um, and obviously we always will be in a sense. But uh, the, you know, where where does the local fit into that? And uh, and then the other thought I was, uh, you did mention it. Um, is it time to resurrect converge and start talking more about that convergence idea with that local 
concept in mind. But those are those are my sort of reflections on a very quick um, uh, review. Um, but th this opportunity now is for everybody else here to um, ask you questions and um, put their reflections forward, if that's OK. So um, let's fire away. Um, has anybody got an immediate thought or idea they'd like to talk to? And uh, I'm not looking at Mike directly, but I know he was there, so I'm sure he might have some common something to say. <laughs> yeah, I can say I can say a few bits. Um, I I suppose I would push back a little bit on the. Uh, I don't think I don't know if half the people from there were from Bristol. <laughs> I mean, I didn't meet many people there. I knew there was a few, but um, I would say there's a lot of people who came in from outside one, one thing that i did i did have i did speak to a few people about the summit and the, there was quite some people did say like they kind of parachuted into bristol didn't really invite that many people from bristol to do stuff i noticed that none of the i mean this is kind of interesting hardly any of the keynote speakers were from bristol and or bristol organizations and some of the sessions which were hosted by people from Bristol it was very last minute so it's quite a kind of a interesting thing there about you know coming to our city and you know I live in Bristol so you know and then you do this big event and then it's kind of like I don't know about a bit secondary um I did think I did think it was good some of the, I had some issues with some of the speakers I mean some of the people there I wouldn't touch with a barge pole but um, particularly Charles Eisenstein, I think, has completely lost it. So having him there was like just a bit like what. Yeah. Um, but the, I mean, I thought it was good. But in terms of this, like, I think there's quite a like fetishization of the, the local and indigenous cultures to a degree. And I'm not saying that there's value. There's value in every in most things, but. It does feel a little bit like, um, you know, I don't, I don't think that the 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 example you gave, Jennifer, of the, you know, the, um, you know, people wanting the tourists in, is where, like, you know, actually, a big issue is how how is how do people sustain themselves and who are, who I mean, it still comes back to like who's in control of the means of production of of life and. You know that's a global question, really, because most of it comes from China or other other places at the moment um, that aren't particularly in our in our cultures. And and I do wonder whether I I think the the one thing you could say that the the crowd at the summit was predominantly middle class. There was very little working class engagement in that in that summit, and I think that's a big issue. Um, and yeah, if you're in a quite comfortable position. Then you, you you know you might go well why why are they you know why do they want to spoil their their land you know it's like well because they're starving or well, because they haven't got the same things that you've got so that that's like pretty um, pretty simple in that sense really um, and the other thing that I suppose like when you've got like when there was a couple of things which I found, I thought it was good. Don't get me wrong, but it was definitely it's definitely a specific type of audience that they're aimed at, and they get to these things. And something like the youth session was done as a side session. Well, I thought the youth the youth session should have been a, probably the keynote session, in a way. And they actually said that themselves. <laughs> they felt like we've been kind of sidelined a bit here, and uh, you know we're we're kind of important. Um, so, and I think that there's a thing about that you know the real diff the, the real difficult conversations are around redistribution of wealth ultimately, really. And you know if we don't if you're not going to have those conversations, because one one thing that's really annoyed me actually about about the thing overall was I, I was in many sessions where people would go, oh we can't be angry and we've got to be everyone's you know we've all got to be nice and it's all about love and. All this there was quite a bit of a new agey vibe to some bits, or a bit like, and I'm like, no, I was thinking you should be really angry 
Like what's going on at the moment? Like the planet's being destroyed by multinational corporations. Like you should be angry. Like you know, I'm not saying like it's not a bad thing to be angry, and I don't like this thing about like being told that I shouldn't be that I shouldn't be angry. Because like really, if you're not angry, I don't know. You're not. What's that thing? If you 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 know you're not angry, you're not taking notice. <laughs> you're not aware of what's going on. So there's like a bit of that, but. Yeah, I, th I think that like, you can't you can't have the conversation about this stuff without thinking about the bigger how bi the bigger fi systems are operating and functioning and how local locals the reason that we're in a lot of these situations is because those bigger systems are massively impacting on local communities. I mean, particularly in this country at the moment. I mean, the cost of living, food banks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, it's like we're the fifth, and we're the what fifth now the fifth I think probably the sixth now richest country in uh in the in the world and we can't sort it out so there's something going on anyway I'll stop ranting because there, there was there was my main criticisms but I did I did quite enjoy a lot of it <laughs> yeah thank you oh, Jenny I'm gonna, I'm just come, come back on that slightly Mike I I I do agree with you my my daughter calls that tone policing yeah, yeah. Uh, you know <laughs> Where you're, oh, oh yes, of course. I know you're what you're saying, but couldn't you say it more nicely? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I do, but I do think there is a genuine issue um, that people are, you know, to look on the put the other side of it. There is a genuine issue that we can't if we spend all our time like super angry, we probably won't be optimally contributing to the change that we want to see. So we, we do all have to manage ourselves in various ways, but that's not, I don't think that's actually what you're really talking about there. Um, and I did I did particularly notice in this booklet, which it sort of sets out to be a kind of statement, that there's quite a lot of talk about, you know, there's quite a lot of talk about global inequality and how terrible it is, uh, but there's nothing about wealth redistribution mm -hmm. and there's nothing actually about how we make equality better. And it's a bit like, as if the idea is that wealth doesn't matter. But as somebody put in The Guardian today, yeah, you can't buy happiness, but it can definitely buy you the foundation on which you can make your happiness, you know. And that that's, you know, so I I, I think there's, and I suppose what I, I think is that that's, that kind of polar, it's kind of polarising. Uh, and, and couldn't we be more about, actually we're going to have to make some real real alliances across these groups um rather than yeah saying oh well you know oh the right are wrong and the left are wrong and we're the only ones that are right kind of angle <laughs> anyway oh yeah it was good to see you there mike <laughs> <laughs> thanks janice uh, uh Nic nicolette um I just wanted to say thank you, Jennifer, for your overview. Um, I think I shared your frustration around the sort of lack of um, strategy, given the the you know, the, the breadth and range of con content which was was there, and also the frustration around not having enough time between all the um, absorbing the content to actually form your own. Um, connections across um within it. Um, having said that, I think that is actually the the absolutely the problem we face. So I think I can't remember which diagram it was, but you had the one uh, you know, with the big cloud of the context in the middle, which through, which everything gets has to um find a way through and. That cloud is actually just a, a a multiplicity of networks and connections, and a lot of which we can't, uh, we don't know, and may never know. Um, so that to for, so experimentation and discovery and just making starting somewhere is going to be an absolute part of that. So it's going to, always going to be very messy. So maybe that hankering we have for a nice strategy, which is going to guide us, is we've just got to let that go. <laughs> um, uh, I also think, as I heard it in 
somewhere on what you said, Jennifer, and I, I, I hang, hang on to this notion of the sort of confluence of thriving resilience sort of localities. Um, and when you, if you can get that, they can all be very different and doing it in the, in, in whatever works best in their particular context, but that's where you're going to somehow carve you know, bigger pathways through that, that cloud in the middle. I'll end it there. <laughs> Thanks. Jen, any thoughts? Well, th thank you very much for that. I, I do agree that that probably, you know, somewhere in the back of even a systems thinker's mind is a sort of nostalgic wish for a plan, <laughs> which, you know, and and you're absolutely right. It's all going to be a massively emergent mess, but I suppose I would have liked a little bit more opportunity to, I, I feel, I, I suppose I felt a little bit like, some kind of leadership of a movement was being sort of enacted with perhaps without actually giving the people there uh, that much of a voice in some way. Um, but then, you know, there wasn't much said about democracy either, frankly, and some of the um, places that have been supported in, um, as, as, you know, quite exemplary societies have been have been um sort of quite restrictive monarchies so i'm a bit mm, not sure about that either <laughs> but yeah it's all it's all complicated and, and countries are different and have their own trajectories but yeah thanks jen uh, uh chris you you, you end up there yes just, it's just to make a contribution to this idea you know what's the point of working locally um, as I see it, the heart of the environmental crisis is the need to reform Western culture. We've lived for thousands of years now, um, centred on humanity, and that's all been very good, and human values, but actually we've not respected the earth. We, we have not, um, and now we have essentially no relationship with the earth. Um, and so... What I see working locally as, as potentially doing is helping us reach the mainstream of people. I've worked with activists now for years in the Bristol Pound, for example, where you know perhaps 2% of the Bristol population were, were involved in the Bristol Pound. Um, but I, I'm interested in the 98% of people who weren't. And I think this is true with many of our environmental initiatives, that they're, that they're engaging a small a small cross section, uh, uh, no, a small section of the people and and the mainstream people are left out and feeling overwhelmed and actually quite powerless. And I think one of the advantages of working locally is just the potential to reach, as I say, the mainstream of people. And it, it requires a completely different strategy, I think. Um, but if we could do that and we could do that appropriately, at every local level, then I think we could be properly subversive of uh, and and positively subversive of the um, the, the mega trends that uh, everybody is also aware of and which are bearing down on us and destroying the earth. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right, Jen, subversion. I like it. I love subversion. Yeah. Yes, smallness is positively subversive. <laughs> That's <laughs> that the title for our new. Oh, next reflection. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't, I don't have anything to add to what you said. That's really, yeah. yeah certainly, yeah. I do that too. Thanks, Chris. Um, uh, Henry. Yeah, I was, um, I was at the event as well, which is where I met Jennif, and um, yeah, it was really good to hear your reflections on it, Jennif, because, um, and I love your bit about movements not being democratic, I hadn't quite <laughs> thought of that, but I do agree that the gold was in the in-between of the sessions, and <clears throat> I found myself more drawn towards the smaller breakout sessions, and in those well, some were better than others, but I think one of the best ones that I went to was there were probably about 
15 people in the room and that was much more collaborative and open. Um, I think that there was quite a lot of homogeneity between the uh, views, even though there was quite a, a diversity of people there. It was quite strange. There seemed to be a lot of agreement, which I, I do agree with you. That can give you a lot of energy and hope, but also... I did sort of come away from it and think, what do I do with that information? It was kind of a, a bit of an enjoyable academic expedition for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the bit which came up for me in your talk then was about your work with the, with the Welsh government. And I'm quite interested in uh, consciousness and adult development and the capacity to be able to understand complex systems and processes and you know a perfect example is the approach by governments to carbon at the moment which i feel very conflicted about because on the one hand i'm delighted that they're getting on board with doing something about co2 emissions but also it's being approached in a very reductionist way where it's being quantified and traded in a way which I kind of think they're not really tackling the root cause of the problem. And I guess that my, my big issue with the whole thing is, do we have the leaders or the people who are advising, who are able to hold all of that uh, and i think that's my that's my big issue so i i don't know what your thoughts are on that yeah. actually um yeah i do have some thoughts on that um yeah i think i do actually think our current crop of leaders are like absolute dinosaurs and they haven't got a blooming clue about about um how to progress them. most most of them don't um and you know the covid inquiry is a classic um kind of expose of that you know um but uh, but you know i i do think the system uh, i suppose i think the system thinking is is really important and that that it could be brought in much more and much more easily um, than people imagine because it's 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 not you know it's quite intuitive a lot of it um and you can also sort of have it at different levels where you know um people everybody can engage and fairly quickly with a, a very simple sort of um feedback diagram but which needs to be much much more elaborated and thought through and so on and so on but they can get the basic idea of what it's all about um which means that you can have you can have some congruence between civil understanding of what the are what's actually their plan uh, uh and professional elaboration of how you make it work which is kind of what you want it raises all sorts of questions about democracy and science which are massively, massively indicated. And a part of the problem we've got is that our public discourse is still working with a notion of science, which is sort of drawn from Newton or something like that. You know, um, evidence-based policy does not understand system sciences. And you could see that so clearly in COVID epidemiology is a system science we could see it uh, working in real time and actually uh, that's one reason I mentioned I did say to Ian we should produce a Schumacher report on on um, we should produce a Schumacher COVID report because it's part it's not it shouldn't just be a blame game uh, it should be hey what did we learn as a society about rapidly changing systems and how we try to understand them, respond to them and steer them. And that's something that governance needs to understand. And yeah, we 
at the moment we are sort of desperately dealing with some very very people who i mean it's quite sad really they just do not have the capacity and the tools to to do the job hmm. look at it that way you know <laughs> poor poor things here they are tasked with doing this job and they haven't got a clue <laughs> <laughs> anyway yeah actually those are my thoughts on that <laughs> thanks thanks jen um uh Veronica Mai. <laughs> Yes, I'm going to find it rather hard to encapsulate the thoughts that have been going through my mind uh, briefly. Uh, Chris actually mentioned something very much along the lines of what I was going to say. Uh, it seems to be, um, to me, um, a new type of them and us. Uh, with uh, We've always had us and, and them of, of some sort or another, but ordinary people, um, I mean to denigrate them but the ordinary people that I bump into and I converse with the ones who are struggling who've got no time I can't help thinking that they would see what we're doing now as just a talk shop not actually doing anything that's how they would view it in my my opinion and this is the difficult thing is actually as Chris said uh, what about the 80 percent who don't, um, you know, they, they don't have the time, they don't have the inclination, they don't really know what's going on. They just struggle from day to day with nobody there to give them a helping hand or to do anything. If you actually talk to, I mean, I found um, some of my, uh, I get through to people with poetry and uh, that gets people nodding quite a lot because it encapsulates something in a way they can understand. And uh, But until we can get local people, uh, we, we are getting some local people, sure, we're getting lots of good groups going. Um, I'd like to see them sort of um, chatting to each other from time to time. Hey, we found this was good. What do you think? So that they exchange... I, I, I'm very much in favour of groups and organisations and everything actually talking to each other so that they know uh, that this worked for us and this is something which, um, you know, have you thought about that? And they exchange all the things. They don't keep reinventing the wheel, for example. Uh, that's all I can say. Uh, really, it, I'm, I'm, mum, I'm rumbling away and not really getting to the point, but I think yet. Jenneth is getting it, I think. She's waving there. That uh, that that's that's our difficulty at the moment is is uh, getting people to feel that they can make a difference, and uh, they are doing, and they need to know more about what difference they can make and how they can make it in simple terms. How do we? How do we? This sort of group and the shoe. I mean, Schu Schumacher have been talking about this for. Uh, I went to some of the very first meetings, and it's the same sort of thing. <laughs> and it's all talk. It, it would appear to some people to be all talk, and that's a shame. Yeah, um, I think that's very. Silly. Um, <laughs> Dennis. Yes, I, I guess, I guess, um, you know, as somebody who believes in lifelong learning and adult education, I think talk is great. Um, but I, uh, I mean, just to say that I think that's partly why we've done something like the Community Climate Toolkit. And we have, you know, events which are more accessible than this. This is quite, you know, I think it's horses for courses as well. And of course, a lot of what Mike Thomas does is is all about trying to get groups to learn from each other and exchange. Um, and indeed, I'm sure some of us, um, you know, the sessions we have are, are varied. Some are more sort of pointed. Um, and my, myself and Ian have been working on, um, working with the Environment Agency on water transition. Uh, approaches and that's something that could directly feed into real change in a fairly major organization so I think there are different levels of making things happen um, and making you know making things happen in our own heads is really really important as well 
uh, because just do it is not a recipe for success. <laughs> but I, I love the poetry angle. I think that's so important that mm. we, we keep up the arts and the feeling side of it all. Yeah. I think sometimes we don't recognise the, the time it takes for change to actually happen. And when we do make small changes, we may think, well, I didn't have any effect at all, but they accumulate, they build up, and you never can trace it back. But, to, you know, so it's always worthwhile doing anything, I feel. However much may feel that you know, we're always up against the same problem. If you, if you do step back 50 years and think about what, what, was, what it was like then when Schumacher wrote Small is Beautiful... Um, quite a, quite a huge amount of change has happened, and uh, it's not all to the, been to the bad. There's been a, a lot of really good things actually happened in that time frame, um, and I think they've come from an accumulation of very small changes in the right direction. But um, yeah, those that's where I think think things are. Um, anybody, Nicolette, you had your hand up. You, you put it down again, or I yeah. <laughs> Two quick pump, um, comments, but I thought the conversation moved on. But I'm gonna just one no. of them. Um, I was um, uh, Jen, if you uh, were talking some interesting comments about um how the COVID inquiry um was answering all the wrong questions and it shouldn't have been a, a blame game, which I, I yeah that resonated with me. But I I would just add to that, it's um it wasn't that all the people. I think a lot of that is embedded in the institute in the institutional, the way those institutions make decisions. And um, they, which is a very sort of mechanistic, linear, sort of hierarchical way of making decisions. And they're, as an institution, they're not suited to um, uh, uh, no, evaluating any decision-making, which is actually very, very complex. Um, uh, so that 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 was uh, one thing. And the other one, I was really interested in the the work you're doing on water transitions. So um, I don't know if you could say a bit more. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, we're hoping that we can get uh, a a resolution of a document uh, finally that we can publish, and then we'll then we'll have a couple of sessions on it because certainly. It's been a very deeply engaging piece of work, hasn't it? <laughs> and yes. we know more about what we know more about transition than we ever imagined we would. Um, and of course, it's um, it's been very it's been very worthwhile and pushed innovation actually to really apply systems to uh, th this particular example. And uh, I have to say, in this respect, you know, Ian's come up with some really great new diagrams and stuff, which can be used as tools as well. So kind of a try uh, always is the case that when you try and apply systems, and I think this is perhaps this is something that we we give ourselves the freedom to do because perhaps we're not we're not tied down by academia or whatever. We innovate on our feet. Um, in a way that you know, I, I think it, it is very inhibited by hierarchical organisations. Uh, so creativity uh, and enjoyment of that is a part of the kind of skill set that we're going to need to help ourselves get through all of this. I agree with you that the organisational forms that we've got aren't suited to that, really. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Mike? Yeah, just coming back on, like, why people don't engage or... And, I mean, I feel like there's a massive inertia in the systems that we're in. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, like, involved in working for tra transition towns and supporting that movement, and I see stuff happening. But in general it's like it seems really really difficult to get to get anything to happen you know and when you do i just think of an example like for so i, I live on fish ponds road in um in bristol and 
there was a campaign against a McDonald's not being built on the road for lots of reasons. You know, it's like right next to a school. It's like on the main road. It's like a drive through. There's loads of reasons. There was a massive campaign against it. Gets stopped, then goes to appeal and just gets accepted. And, you know, and it's like the problem is like, I think people people don't people feel quite disempowered and, and actually are quite disempowered in reality. It's not like it's not like they're feeling it from a you know, it's not like, oh, I, I'm just don't uh, if you know this thing about like, oh, you've actually got power. No, no, you haven't. Actually, you haven't got a lot of power over many things. Um, and the things that people do have power over, which we see, which we've seen more recently, is like in, in well, in Holland, for example, you know, with the voting in of the, the far right guy Gert Waters, is like when you know when people are not feeling listened to or about thing topics. And I mean, you know, the one thing that wasn't talked about, I, I think, where you know, the local futures thing really falls down to a degree is you don't talk about things like, why is it that people are really worried about immigration? Why is, what what's the pol the polarising things that are going on? And simplistic, the simplistic solutions that are offered by those in power to remain in power. And like, and if we don't talk about these things and explore them, then, you know, we're, we're kind of, you know, we're kind of over here in our world. Mm. And there's all these other people over here in another world. And we're not, you know, we're not. I mean, I think there's a thing with like the systems thinking approaches. Yeah, I mean, there's loads of things that we could all go if we just did, you know, if we educated people properly and, and make them let them understand, like, you yeah. know, did media literacy training. If we didn't have like, you know, four newspapers which dictate a lot of the, the narratives in this country. If we didn't have an establishment which wants to just pulperize its population, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like we we you know we the all these things would be better but the po the problem is there's huge amounts of vested power within these systems and these people don't want to give that power up and it's not just a case of like us going oh yeah it would make more sense if you just did it this way <laughs> <laughs> you know that that's yep. like because they don't want to give the power up and and that that was not talked about really you know the the, the fact that mm. That that's the big challenge. I think that like, you know we all we can analyze stuff and we can go. These are the, these are the solutions. The problem is, how do you get from here, where the situation we're in, to a situation where we're not where we're able to do those things? You know, it's Gene Gene was uh, was it Gene Bolton who did the session about well, like, how do we be disruptive to systems, existing yep. systems to get change? Things like this. I mean, that's probably, I think I'm coming more from that angle of like, how do we disrupt or get rid of the inertia in systems to create the change? Right. I quite agree with you, Mike. And it's uh, often that subversive approach, uh, the obliqueness of how to tackle this is what we need. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, uh, Jen, do you want to say anything or should we ask you to have a say? No, let's hear from you i'm i don't have any really anything to add to what mike's said i think Just agree with right. it <laughs> <laughs> thanks mike yeah um, so hugh hugh are you there hugh yeah i'm taking it yeah first of all i like to that question that uh Jen have posed, how damn big is small? I think that's a very good question, because what do we mean by small? I mean, I live in I live in a London borough, Croydon, which has a population of 410,000, which is bigger than many cities across the country. You know, mm. I don't, what's the population of Bristol? Tell me in a minute. They think, <laughs> going about disruptive and change, I, I wrote my PhD when I was about 46 on the, the new urban left. This was a it's an example of disruption that can lead to great change. There was a number of local authorities in London, London Borough of Lambeth, Hackney, Islington, the in the London Education Authority, the GLC, and perhaps Manchester Council as well, who you know involved their local communities in decision making. I remember going to County Hall in the 1980s. It was a real locus for local community groups. You know, debate, dis subversion, disruption, argument, and out of that came a great number of what were then radical policies, which are now mainstream, you know, gender equality, anti-racism, 
gay rights, equality at work, things like contract compliance that local authorities brought in at the local level, which are, many of which are now accepted both nationally and internationally. So there's a good link between the local, the national and the international. What happened though was those local authorities came up with a very powerful central government. And what's happened since, I mean, I come from a background of local democracy, local government, which I think could have a really important role to play in the kind of disruptive changes we're talking about, has been so simply starved of resources, probably 50% cuts in the last 13 years, that it's very, very difficult for local governments to do that now. You know, local government, which was an enabler of local community action. I'm sure some of that goes on. But those examples show that it can be done, but resources are needed for that to be done. And both physical resources and money resources. And uh, I'm not sure, I haven't been involved that much in local government recently, but I don't, I don't think those kind of activities and the initiatives and that big picture, that bold vision, is there at the moment, is it's more a reactive thing to dealing with food banks, the cost of living crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's a real, a real challenge, I think. But I think going back to the anger point too, I think you can be angry, but I think anybody on the progressive movement on the left or whatever, the centre left, has to still remain positive. Because I do agree with Ian, things that we do now have an impact for the future. Back then, perhaps some community worker went to a meeting at the GLC and argued their case in relation to gender equality and support for women's groups. Maybe they went away thinking that's not going to make much difference, but down the line it did. So mm. everything we do, I think, can make a difference. You may not know it, but it can make a difference. And so uh, it's difficult to remain optimistic, but I think one has to remain optimistic. There's no other alternative, is there? Thank you. I think I think Jen would agree with that. Thumbs up sign. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent indeed. Um, John. Uh, I'd just like to follow up um, what Hugh was saying. Um, yeah, local democracy is important, but we've seen power taken away from local democracy over the last 40 or so years on, on, a, on a regular and consistent basis. And if we think back to 30s, 40s, 50s, there were a number of economic theorists who thought that capitalism wasn't actually, com or democracy wasn't actually compatible with democracy. Mm. The best thing to do was to suppress it in the best possible way, uh, being is, is to, to eradicate the way people can, can actually make a difference, which I think they've been very effective at through, through a number of ways. But I think what is, is, is potentially undermining of that is actually what we're doing at the moment, is not just discussing things, but, dis but, but discussing things within a group who are geographically scattered everywhere. You know, and, and, this, and what I'm trying to say is that we talk about levels, local, national, regional, global, but I wonder whether these levels actually really exist. You know, we have people here all over the country and in other countries. We know what's going on all over the world, thanks to social media and digital technology. We have huge companies and, and governments trying to suppress the variety of, 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 of things things what's going on but you know even if we live in a particular place we are linked into lots of other groups lots of other individuals and everything in a, in a, in, a, in effect is is interconnected now uh, certainly our ability to to communicate and to learn from others so I think if we are going to be subversive, then we need to be able to, to exploit those connections mm. and, and use it, d draw on and learn from people's experiences all over the world through the technology we're using at the moment. 
Mm. That was quite incoherent, but I, th- oh. I hope fully you get ten percent of what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I do got hundred ten percent. Thank, thank you, John. Um, Dan, any thoughts on that? It's a sort of re a redefinition of local, maybe coming through there. Well, well, I suppose this speaks to the question of can you actually have a global movement for localism? Mm. Um, where, which I, you know, I sort of think you can actually because. Um, I think, as John was saying, that uh, I think you can use all sorts of tools and techniques to talk about common elements of things that happen, even in really different contexts, you know, and that you can, so no situation is ever the same as another. And you can never just transfer things from one situation to another. But you can learn such a lot from seeing how other people do stuff. And, you know, this is this can this already does is beginning to happen in in um, all sorts of ways. And I guess that's what Eco Lees is trying to do, for example, is to um, is to sort of extend the knowledge uh, of of all the different initiatives to across each other and um mm. help help people communicate in the, in the way John's suggesting i mean certainly um the whole you know the whole area of let's say comparative sustainable economy uh, where uh, countries and regions and organisations look at how other places are dealing with all sorts of different things and compare and contrast, etc. You know, that's a really worthwhile activity and that is that is happening. So, you know, and, you know, there again, it's sort of it's a worthwhile it's a worthwhile intellectual effort to try to develop frameworks and tools that can help facilitate these things to happen. And I think that's partly what we're about uh, in the Institute, you know. Oops, another toolkit coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Um, Nic- Nicolette, your thoughts there? Um, yes, yeah, so lovely. Um thoughts coming coming out now I just um I think it was John I loved your um expression of the fact that actually we all sort of move around between the sort of local regional whatever national international in you know within a day we we connect at all those different levels and even more so because of the technology we have to to facilitate that and um I and it just I think the more we become aware of the, when we're doing that, the more we'll we'll be enriched um, as as to how we might influence it, those different sort of in, well which which system we're in, as it were. And so that's one. So thanks for that 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 for John. And I also just wanted to bring together um, Mike's uh, uh, um, observation that. Now, what we really need to be disrupting are the power relationships if we want to uh, make an and pretending that those power um, disparities aren't there is is um, ignoring them. We do that at our peril, um, which I think I completely agree with that. And then also um, Hugh, I think it was Hugh, was saying that uh, um, local governments don't underestimate what local governments can do if it, well if you can get enough resources to do it but and I I think I think if you're going to disrupt power relationships I think local is the place to do it because it's um it's very difficult to people know what's going on it's, it's much more transparent and then if you can find um if local communities find um Combine. It's much easier for them to combine and actually um, okay. change the power, permeate the existing power relationships. Um, yeah. yeah. 
Can I, can I just say one thing in response to that, which is because it was something I read years ago, and it was by um, the, the philosopher uh, uh, Slavov Zizek, who, I, like, some of his stuff's great, some of it's not so great, but he just basically said that if we just demanded that they do what they said they're going to do, <laughs> like, like <laughs> that's, that's, that, because we're, t- we're told all the time, to- you know, like, levelling up. You yeah. Know, it just didn't happen. Like, it's not like, he said, because his argument was that they can't, they can't deliver on what they're saying. And and it's like, if we just kept, if we, if we, our sole thing was just saying to people, look, we're not even asking for more. You just need to go and demand mm-hmm. what they've said they're going to do. That could be actually quite radical, <laughs> you know. Yes, as, as, as an approach, because most people would start going like, "Well, it isn't. It isn't happening." Like, <laughs> you know, yeah, holding the feet to the coals, as they say. Yes, yeah. Hmm. Interesting thoughts. That reminds me of a joke that my brother posted on Facebook, which went something along the. It'll lose a bit in translation, so forgive me. But something like, "How many tourists does it take to change a light bulb?" Um, None, because they'll just say that they've changed it, and then the BBC will keep on telling us how much brighter it's getting. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was quite good. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so giving, we're giving away our political predilections here. Oh, no! Um, it's beginning to get towards the end of brain running out the ears time. Well, that's... So, cool. um, <laughs> John? John, hand up. Last Sorry, one. Yeah. Last comment from John. <laughs> um, what struck me recently, well, I do last half an hour or so, when we've been talking about local, global, and, and so on, is how the war in the Middle East currently is affecting everybody. Yes. Virtually throughout the world. Yes. And that what we've seen mm, mm. Uh, is a response either on one side of the nub or another, if not directly and coordinated by one body, then somehow spontaneously emerging in different parts of the world to support or oppose what's what, what's going on. And I think that reinforces the interconnectedness of, of our global world, the global village, as Marshall McLuhan spoke about it. But having said that, what I sometimes sort of worry about is why something like a war, which in, in global terms is taking place in a very small place, affecting relatively few people, has such mass, has such a massive impact when environmental issues, certainly climate change, which is huge, doesn't generate the same type of response and is going to affect everyone to some degree everywhere. Mm. And, 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 And what I'd like to see is that type of passion which is generated through, you know, the conflict in in in, uh, in the Middle East, replicated uh, by by more environmental issues, which at the moment it just isn't happening. Mm. Even even the climate change, even thanks to Greta Thunberg, it's still not happening anywhere near to the extent which it needs to. John, I think that's a very good place to to end this on those thoughts because. Um, in a way, we're asking everybody to come along on the December the 12th, our next session, with the ideas of systems thinking, hope, meaning and spirituality. I think that plays very much into the kind of issues you were talking about there. We need to really work on that. So um, that's my plug for the next session. <laughs> Before we get to that, I think I'd just like to say a big thank you to, to Janice for taking us through today and uh, giving us such a good insight into uh, that and opening up our minds to many thoughts around local global issues and um yeah and i think like all of these uh, i've got a list of challenges of things we've got to get on with now so um, <laughs> uh, yeah 
that's that's our task for the future. Um, Jen, any last words? Well, just that, um, yes, hope, hopefully, you know, it, it's it's all a bit of a mess uh, right now in your head, probably. But tomorrow morning, you may get a few interesting thoughts emerge. So, you know, right. let, let us know what they are and or bring them along to our Christmas session. <laughs> right. Thank you, Jen. And uh, I'd like to say, thanks, say, for, say thanks that, uh, for staying the course, everybody. Yeah. Thanks. A big thank you, Jen. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Okay, bye. 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 Oh, everybody has gone. Hmm.